Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elena Crosby, and it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Florida Chapters of the Federal Society to our 2018 annual Florida Chapters Conference. This is our fourth conference, and it is our largest conference yet by a large margin. I will add that our conference sold out this year. True to form, this secret organization continues to publicize its events. <laughs> we are honored to present a distinguished slate of panel and speakers capped off with our first banquet in celebration of the Federalist Society and the principles by which it is committed. If you are local to the Central Florida area, we encourage you to join prominent legal scholars, judges, and practitioners at the lawyer, Orlando Lawyers chapter events. For more information on upcoming events, please visit our website at www.orlandofedsoc.org for more information. I now have the honor of introducing Jimmy Petronis, Florida's Chief Financial Officer. He is a native Floridian born and raised in Panama City. He earned a ba <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Went too many pauses. <laughs> he earned a bachelor's degree in political science from Florida State University. He is a partner in a family-owned seafood restaurant called Captain Anderson. His public service career began with experience as an intern in the Florida Senate and the United Kingdom's House of Commons. Following his college graduation, Governor Lawton Childs appointed him to the Florida Elections Commission, and he was later reappointed by Governor Jeb Bush. He served in the Florida House of Representatives from 26 to 2014. He was appointed to serve on Florida's Public Service Commission, as well as the Constitution Revision Commission. He is recognized for outstanding leadership and has been committed to active civic engagement and business development. Please join me in giving the Honorable Jimmy Petronas a warm welcome. Thank you, Elena. It's an uh, irony that first time I met Elena, I remember as we, we introduced, it was right after Hurricane Irma, we had a, a joint um, insurance village in Jacksonville, and uh, there on behalf of Senator Rubio's office, and. The name Elena is kind of a derivative of my mother's name, Helen, and I've got a niece named Melanie. So you kind of, you pick up on things and you connect, and when you hear that name, you, you don't forget how you, you relate because of just family names. But it's a, it's a real honor to be here with you today, such a distinguished group of, of leaders from all over our state, uh, friendly faces, those that, that make a difference. Um, but to, to, to welcome you today is, is truly an honor. My, uh, my family, uh, Personally and professionally and through our business, we, we, we built what we have today directly based on constitutional pr principles of, of freedom and equality. And uh, I truly, I, I understand this importance. I understand that building foundations of these, these giants created that came before us. And I view that responsibility as both an honor that to have both personally and professionally in life. But it doesn't mean that just building on this of the giants of our time, but it's also honoring, respecting the giants that first laid this foundation. I've been afforded an incredible opportunity to serve on the Florida cabinet. And as your chief financial officer, it's an incredibly important job. And I tell people affectionately, I'm the business manager for the state. I keep the trains running on time. I pay all the bills. I ensure that, that we don't bounce checks. And I work every day to ensure that we're good stewards of the state's monies, of the taxpayers' monies, that our treasury is fiscally sound, and that we make strong investments. But one of the responsibilities that we have in our office is also to, insure, uh, to investigate insurance fraud so we can ensure that your insurance rates stay low so that you can make sound fiscal investments with your money and so that you can prosper. Now, since July 1, we've arrested nearly 500 various individuals for insurance fraud in this state. We've also returned over $17 million back to the citizens of the state of Florida through our consumer health hotline. We've returned $160 million in unclaimed property. Has anybody ever been to our unclaimed property website? It's incredible. Take some time and go check it out, fltreasurehunt.org. Worth your time to check it. It's not mobile friendly, so don't do it during my speech. 
And, and we've also returned, well, I'll, I'll restate that. We've protected over $10 million of potential fraud through public assistance. We are also the, the law enforcement arm of public assistance fraud in the state. I'm incredibly proud of the achievements, but I don't want to waste this opportunity. I want to ensure that we continue to do this right by you. Florida CFO is unique. It's a position that encompasses many different roles, but it also underscores the importance of a separation of powers that we have at the cabinet. The Florida cabinet officials are independent of each other, and our autonomy brings a unique perspective, varied opinions, and policy conversations to the table. The separation is a good thing. It's one that helps keep our powers in check. As we look worldwide, we can see devastating effects of governments that don't have this in their system. But we don't need to look too far because it exists right here in our local nation, our local state, and local governments. During my time in public service, I've seen it in the legislature, and as now CFO, I've seen it firsthand. And let's take a look into rulemaking. Rulemaking can slowly erode the lines of separation that gives the unique power of altering legal rights outside the legislative process. And in my opinion, some people are more interested in building power and providing for themselves the opportunities to assert power in outside groups. Many constitutions have been written throughout the world, and those are different, but ours is unique. Some of these other constitutions is the government grants you these rights. Ours is the people grant the rights to the government. And it's the people who have the authority to provide limitations to government to protect the fundamental rights of every one of our citizens. The U.S. Constitution has provided solid guidance in this role. And to put it plainly, the legislative branch writes the laws, the executive branch executes the laws, and the judicial branch interprets those laws. Overreaching rulemaking bypasses and ignores these very roles. Our citizens are owed rights, protections of those who came and carefully crafted those. When Justice Scalia said in his speech, what makes an American? I am where I am in part because my predecessors bore that responsibility well, and I hope to do the same. Let me repeat that. I am where I am in part because my predecessors bore that responsibility well, and I hope to do the same. He talks about his proud heritage as an Amer Italian uh, American and what this nation has given him, principles of freedom and equality. This is the foundation of a free society. It is one that allows us to express our will without fear of government retribution. And that's why I've taken the role as CFO incredibly seriously. It's funny, I'm, I'm Greek, and uh, it was years ago that uh, I remember my uncle talked to me about the word ago. Does anybody know what the word ago means? It means I. It also is the derivative of the word ego. So as these decisions we make and we work to do to serve our Floridians are guided by the principle our founding fathers had set, not the word, not to serve our own ego. And uh, I'll never forget, I remember when I was, everybody would get their first cell phone and you get to pick your phone number. I remember I was sitting there with the girl I was dating at the time who, who didn't become my wife, but I'm very happy now. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we're sitting there and, and the, the, it's just back when you're sitting across a table and it's an install phone in the car. And they gave me the phone number of um, 832-3400. And she looked at the keypad and 3400 spells out ego. And to have a cell phone installed in your car was pretty egotistical. So it was, uh, it was something that I always kind of stuck with, but how important it is to be a servant to one. And that's where I've been my whole entire life. We can make easy choices. We can take the path of least resistance that often lead to erosion of our constitutional values. But we were forgetting those giants that came before us, the ones who made the decisions to put their name on a piece of paper who could have just as easily been signing their own death warrant. Our foundation isn't new. It can be traced back in history with the Greeks, with democracy, with the Romans, with the Republic, and with the Americans, with our Constitution. 
all based on the original principle that government serves the governed. Thank you. It has been an honor to speak and join you today to kick off this event. God bless you all, and I look forward to joining you later. I'd now like to introduce Harut Samra. He is with Miami Lawyers Chapter, and he will be introducing this next panel. Thank you, Elena. It, as Elena mentioned, it is my good fortune to introduce the next panel titled Departures from the American Rule on Attorney's Fees. And the, the panel's moderator, Judge Robert Luck, of course, is known to all of us. Judge Robert Luck was appointed to the Third District Court of Appeal by Governor Rick Scott and took his seat on March 6, 2017. Before his appointment, Judge Luck served on the 11th Judicial Circuit for four years in the criminal, civil, and appellate divisions, where he tried 70 jury trials and heard dozens of appeals from the county court and municipal agencies. Prior to his service on the bench, Judge Luck was an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of Florida, where he tried 19 jury trials before federal district court and argued three appeals to the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. Earlier in his career, Judge Luck was a legislative correspondent for two United States senators and a law clerk and staff attorney to Circuit Judge Edward E. Carnes of the 11th Circuit and an appellate practitioner in the Miami office of greenberg Troy. The only blemish, I would say, in an otherwise faultless credentials is the fact that he went to the University of Florida, I will say. Judge Luck received his Juris Doctor from the University of Florida, Levin College of Law, where he graduated with every possible recognition, including magna cum laude honors, order of the coif, and having served as the editor-in-chief of the Florida Law Review. Judge Luck also received his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Florida with high honors, or highest honors. Judge Luck, like his father before him, was born and raised in Miami-Dade County and is a product of the Miami-Dade County Public Schools, graduating from North Miami Beach Senior High School. He still lives in Northeast Miami-Dade County with his wife and two children. All that said, and those of you who know him will agree, Judge Luck is one of the brightest stars in our state's judicial firmament, and we're lucky beneficiaries of his public service. Judge Luck. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so currently, the legislature is considering a number of provisions dealing with exceptions to and applications of the American rule uh, for attorney's fees. This is going on right now in the legislature regarding personal injury protection legislation, regarding first party property insurance cases, and regarding workers' compensation. And uh, this, I'm glad the CFO, I'm glad to be following the CFO, who uh, in an article in our uh, in the Miami's Daily Business Review from last month was discussing uh, workers comp changes in attorney's fees with regard to workers' compensation and said, quote, I think two-way attorney's fees restrictions with regard to workers' compensation is a good debate to have. We're going to have a debate today regarding exceptions to the American rule. Um, and it is this distinguished panel that we have who is going to be having that debate. It is my honor to introduce them. I will introduce them in the order that they are sitting. Uh, to my immediate left is Hinda Klein. Ms. Klein is an equity partner with the statewide insurance defense firm of Conroy Simberg. Ms. Klein has been practicing since 1985, and she has served as the head of Conroy Simberg's appellate department since 1991. In 1995, Ms. Klein became one of the first board-certified appellate attorneys in the state of Florida. Ms. Klein has been involved in over 700 appeals in all Florida state courts, as well as the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. She is admitted to practice before all Florida state and federal courts, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and the United States Supreme Court. 
Ms. Klein has been named as a Florida super lawyer, which means that, uh, that she has uh, been peer reviewed and afforded the top 5% of attorneys since the inception of that publication in 2006. Ms. Klein pre previously served as chairman of the Broward County Appellate Practice Committee. She has also been a past member of the Florida Bar Appellate Rules Committee, and she currently serves uh, as a member of the Civil Pre uh, Procedure Rules Committee. She has been a member of the Broward County uh, Stephen Bohr Inns of Court for over 20 years, and Ms. Klein was also a guest editor of the book Florida Pretrial Practice, published by James Publishing. Ms. Klein graduated from Syracuse University College of Law, where she was notes and comments editor of the Law Review and a member of the Moot Court Board. Ms. Klein received her undergraduate degree from that great institution, uh, the University of Florida. Uh, <laughs> next uh, to my left is Professor Brian Fitzpatrick. Professor Fitzpatrick is a professor of law at Vanderbilt Law School, where his research focuses on class action litigation. In 2010, he published a comprehensive empirical study of class action settlements in federal court called An Empirical Study of Class Action Settlements and Their Fee Awards. Uh, his current project is the forthcoming book, The Conservative Case for Class Actions. Professor Fitzpatrick graduated first in his class from Harvard Law School and went on to clerk for Judge O'Scanlan on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and then Justice Scalia on the United States, Court of, on the United States Supreme Court. After his clerkships, Professor Fitzpatrick practiced commercial and appellate litigation for several years at Sidley Austin in Washington, D.C. And before earning his law degree, Professor Fitzpatrick graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor's of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Notre Dame. To the left of Professor Fitzpatrick is Bruce Berman. Uh, Mr. Berman is a partner at Carleton Fields Jordan Burt where he focuses his nationwide practice on large and complex commercial disputes in federal and state and appellate courts and in domestic and international arbitration tribunals. He represents U.S. and international clients in cases spanning a wide range of substantive law, including aviation, corporate finance, securities, mergers and acquisitions, health law, intellectual property, and real estate and commercial lending. Mr. Berman heads that firm's uh, aviation industry group. A legal scholar and author of a leading state treaties, Berman's Florida Civil Procedure, which I know everyone in here has used. Mr. Berman has been recognized by the Florida Supreme Court and the Florida Bar by long-term appointments to numerous committees, including the Committee on Standard Jury Instructions in Civil Cases, the Civil Procedure Rules Committee, and the Rules of Judicial Administration Committee. In his role as chair of the Civil Procedure Rules Committee, Mr. Berman argued the committee's first petition in the Florida Supreme Court on offers of judgments. And we're going to hear a little bit about that as part of his presentation. Finally, uh, to the, uh, all the way to the left side, and that's not done on purpose, of course, is Hugh Lumpkin, uh, born in San Tome, Venezuela, uh, where he re uh, Mr. Lumpkin received his Bachelor of Arts from Duke University in 1977 and a JD from the University of Miami in 1980. He is admitted to the Florida Bar and the US, court, U.S. District Courts for the Southern, Middle, and Northern Districts of Florida, the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, and the U.S. Supreme Court. Mr. Lumpkin is the name partner and former managing shareholder of Verplug and Lumpkin PA, a leading law firm in representing policyholders in disputes with their insurers. Verplug and Lumpkin devotes its practice to complex insurance matters and litigation and appeals involving insurance coverage and unfair insurer conduct. While Mr. Lumpkin has had an extensive policyholder insurance coverage trial and appellate practice since 1986, this has been his exclusive focus since joining his current firm. He has written extensively on insurance issues and has, issues and has appeared as a frequent lecturer for the American Bar Association and other organizations that provide educational and business opportunities to professionals. His practice consists of representing policyholders in evaluating, settling, and litigating insurance claims filed in state and federal court, trial of coverage and extra contractual claims, as well as appellate practice. Please join me in, in welcoming this distinguished panel. So uh, we're going to start by having each of the panelists uh, give a presentation, and then afterwards uh, we'll engage in some questioning, and then at the end take some questions from uh, all of you, because I know you all are going to have lots of good questions for the panel. Uh, so, uh, Professor Fitzpatrick, we'll start with you. Thank you, Judge, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, I do teach at, at Vanderbilt in Nashville, and many of you are probably wondering why is someone from Tennessee here at your Florida Chapters Conference? 
Uh, and the answer is obvious. I needed an excuse to go to Disney World. Um, but no, the, the, the truth is I've become very friendly with a great number of people in the Florida chapter of the Federalist Society. And I'm honored to have been invited to come down and talk to an even bigger group of you. One of the nice things about the Federalist Society, as many of you know, is that you do become friendly with so many talented people all across the United States um, by staying active in this organization. And so I'm very privileged uh, to be a part of the organization and very honored to be here today. Um, so we're talking about the American rule on attorney's fees. And as everyone knows, uh, the reason why they call it the American rule is because America is somewhat unique uh, in the world in that we do not have a general loser pays regime that we make each side, for the most part, pay their own attorney's fees whether they win or they lose. Now, when we say that America is somewhat unique in this way, um, one thing that we should keep in mind is that in other countries where they do have loser pays, um, my understanding from um, interacting with scholars from many of those countries is that uh, it's not a full loser pays in most other countries in the world. Most other countries that have loser pays, they have statutory caps on how much in fees is shifted to the loser. They usually have a statutory cap on the hourly rate that the lawyers are allowed to shift to the other side. And so I think when I speak to scholars in other countries, and I'd be curious if anyone has their own experiences here, what I am told is it's really partial loser pays around the world. Uh, but America is still unique in that we don't even do the partial thing for most of our cases. There are, of course, plenty of examples in the United States where we have uh, created special exceptions to the American rule, where we do have something of a loser pays. We are familiar with many of the statutes that allow prevailing plaintiffs to recover their fees from the defendant. These are what I call a one-way loser pays provision, and it's different than what people usually envision around the world as loser pays, which is a two-way scheme. No matter who loses, they have to pay. A lot of our loser pays laws are one-way, and they usually only benefit plaintiffs. Um, in my area, class actions, there is another exception to the American rule. Um, it's called the common benefit doctrine. It's a common law exception to the American rule, which basically forces class members to pay for the fees of the class action attorney, whether they consent to that or not. Um, it's not forcing the defendant to pay, but it's, it's forcing people who did not hire the class attorney to pay uh, for fees. And so we, we have a number of exceptions to the American rule in our law, but they tend to be one-way exceptions. It's not very common that we see a two-way rule like they have in other countries in the world. So many tort reform advocates would like to go to a two-way rule. Um, and many tort reform advocates don't want the partial two-way rule that most of the other rest of the world has. Many tort reform advocates want the full-blown two-way loser pays rule. So one question I want to address with you all today is what would happen? What would happen to litigation in our country if we did go full bore with the two-way loser pays rule? And law and economics scholars have studied this question with lots of equations uh, for many, many years. And the models are not 100% consistent, but law and economics scholars tell us, for the most part, the conventional view among scholars is if we go to a two-way loser pays like many tort reform advocates want, two things will happen. Number one. Plaintiffs will bring better cases than they do now. Plaintiffs will stop bringing long shot cases and they will select into cases that are higher probability winners. That's what the models suggest. That's effect number one. Effect number two, the cost of litigation will go up. It will go up not so much because the cases the plaintiffs pick are better. It will go up because both sides think there's a chance they're going to win. 
and both sides think the other side is going to end up paying their fees because of that. And so because both sides think the other side might end up paying their fees, they'd spend more on litigation. That's what the, the models suggest would happen. Plaintiffs pick better cases, but both sides spend more money litigating those cases. So the first question is, is that on balance good or bad? It sounds good if plaintiffs are filing more meritorious cases. That sounds like a great effect. Sounds bad if everyone is spending more money litigating. Whether on net it is good or bad is a very difficult empirical question to sort out. But the state of Florida actually conducted a natural experiment, what we call in the academy a natural experiment on a two-way loser pays rule. And so we actually have some real life data to answer the question whether the net effects are good or bad. And many of you may know this history better than I do, I suspect you do, but in the mid 80s, 1980s, the medical malpractice insurance industry lobbied the state to adopt a loser pays rule in medical malpractice cases. This rule was in effect for five years and then the medical malpractice insurance industry lobbied the state to repeal it and go back to the American rule. What happened? Exactly what our friends in the Law and Economics Department told us would happen. The plaintiffs filed better cases, so the insurers were actually paying out bigger judgments because they were losing more often and they were losing bigger when they did. Number two, everyone was spending more money on litigation. The insurance companies were spending more money on litigation just like the law and economics professors suggested. So the net effect was the medical malpractice insurance company was paying a lot more money every year out under loser pays than they did under the American rule. And so they <coughs> asked to repeal it and, the, and Florida did that. So what does that suggest to us about uh, our good old American rule? Well, the first thing it suggests to me is a two-way loser pays rule may not be the panacea that a lot of tort reform people think it is and the state of Florida is exhibit A, I think, and why it may not be. So what can we do if two-way loser pays doesn't work? I like the one-way loser pay. I like the idea of one-way loser pays because you don't have the dysfunction of both sides thinking the other side is going to pay their fees, which is what drove up the litigation costs in the economic models and in the Florida experiment. If you only have one side having to have fees shifted to them, plaintiff or defendant, you don't have that dysfunction. Now, as I noted at the outset, many of our statutory exceptions to the American rule are one-way rules in favor of plaintiffs. And the reason why we put those rules into place is because people thought plaintiffs did not have resources to litigate against corporate defendants or government defendants. And, um, there may have been some merit to that view at some point in American history, but I don't think there's much merit to that view anymore because there is this growing industry that I know many of you are aware of, of third-party litigation finance. And this industry will fund any case that has a positive expected value. And so even if your plaintiff's firm does not have the resources or your plaintiff does not have the resources to take on a defendant, the hedge funds and the other investors do have the resources to do it. And so I think that the one-way fee-shifting statutes that we have to favor plaintiffs don't make a lot of sense like they may have in the past. What would make sense? Well, I actually am in favor of a one-way fee-shifting rule against plaintiffs in one very particular context, on summary judgment. As many of us in this room are aware, there are a lot of litigation dysfunctions that arise from discovery costs. Plaintiffs typically do not have as much to be discovered from them as defendants do, and for this reason, plaintiffs can use discovery to drive up the settlement value of their cases by imposing unnecessary litigation costs on defendants. It's a problem we've known about for decades. The federal rulemakers 
tinker with the rules on occasion to try to do something about it, but it has not had much of a dramatic effect on these perverse incentives that plaintiffs have to drive up settlement values and cases by asking for discovery. My proposal is it, let the plaintiffs ask for whatever they want in discovery, but if they find nothing and they lose their case on summary judgment, then they jointly and severably liable with their lawyer should have to pay the defendant's discovery costs back. This will cause plaintiffs to be much more careful about the cases they file and the discovery they ask for, but it will not cause the perverse effects of the two-way shifting on driving up everyone's litigation costs. This is a proposal to drive down litigation costs, not drive it up. So the point that I wish to leave you with is two-way loser pays may be a loser, but one-way loser pays for one-way problems like discovery might be a winner. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we're going to hear about the offer a judgment statute from Mr. Berman. Uh, thank you, Judge Locke, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear here. I uh, have never been before or with this group before, but I see some friends in the audience, and, um, and I'm honored to be able to, to join all of you. Uh, I think I have uh, probably been um, thought of, at least for this panel, because I have lived an experiment in fee shifting in uh, Florida jurisprudence now for the last 32 years, I think. Um, as Judge Luck had mentioned, I uh, had the honor of chairing the Civil Procedure Rules Committee for a couple of years in the latter part of the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and it was a time when I was uh, clearly a lot younger <laughs> and, uh, and probably uh, a little bit more liberal um, thinking. And, uh, and I, I was a pretty strong proponent on the, on the committee for uh, f for doing something to, uh, to inhibit what, what I had perceived at that stage of my practice as being litigation, which was uh, uh, probably fits into the group that Professor Fitzpatrick was talking about that, uh, that wouldn't bring so many cases if they had to pay. Uh, but, the, um, uh, but it was a time also when there was, there was a bit of, and I should say preliminarily that um, I, I'm not going to talk about the details of um, uh, of how of the mechanics of how the offer of judgment works that would take um, a day probably or more as I think everybody knows um, I, I've got to say that over the years that um, that this issue that these issues have been litigated they have taken over a large segment of my now very long treatise uh, and um, and I'll address some of those things a little bit in a, in a general way but but really what I'd like to do for purposes of this um, Discussion, and I hope it generates some uh, some interest and uh, and views from all of you. Is to look at this as the experiment that's taken place over these 32 years, and get a sense of whether this is really getting us to the place that it was originally designed to get us, uh, and uh, and how uh, I'd be very interested to hear how uh, many of our lawyers and judges feel about that. I can uh, I'll certainly give you an indication of how I do. <laughs> the um, in the beginning, in the, in the late 80s, there, there was a, a bit of a race uh, to the offer of judgment um, place that we've gotten to today, a race between the Civil Procedure Rules Committee and, um, and the Florida Legislature, a race which the Rules Committee lost. Well, I, I know I and a lot of uh, my colleagues back at the time on the committee uh, were, uh, looked at the Federal Rule, Rule 68, which was a one-way uh, offer of judgment and for which the only sanction was costs. Uh, and that clearly was something which was generally, uh, had virtually no utility at all uh, in, uh, in influencing the course of litigation. And so the, the idea, uh, at least, and it was an idea, idea that was shared uh, in a lot of different places, was that uh, there was some, something to be said for discouraging unnecessary litigation, I think, in. Uh, uh, late 80s, the Supreme Court talked about offers of judgment as, as intended to reduce litigation costs to conserve judicial resources uh, by encouraging settlement. And, uh, and that was really the idea. But, uh, but the legislature beat the Rules Committee to it and did it in a kind of an odd way. And uh, it happened with tort reform. Uh, so the 1986 Tort Reform and Insurance Act 
created the first uh, Section 768.79, which still exists today, which was the offer of judgment and demand for judgment statute that made this uh, bilateral and, uh, and added this, uh, this component of attorney's fees as a, a really um, uh, as a sanction to discourage. You can look at it one of two ways, either as a sanction to discourage or as, uh, as a right that, um, to encourage. And I, and I don't see that as purely semantic because I think it reflects on some of the constitutional questions that are raised as to whether this is really something which, which uh, I and the committee at the time viewed as part of the uh, state Supreme Court's rulemaking authority uh, to discourage litigants who were, um, who were using the system uh, f for uh, really in a way that was more abusive than uh, constructive and, uh, and that the, uh, the rulemaking authority that was constitutionally uh, provided to the uh, state Supreme Court uh, was something which would enable the court to sanction uh, any kind of uh, misconduct in litigation. Uh, and, uh, and, and there was, a, of course, the tension between that consideration and the consideration of attorney's fees, which in the United States has always been considered, uh, certainly in Florida, uh, as a substantive right, and therefore entirely within on the legislative side uh, of the uh, separation of powers. So the uh, 86 Tort Reform Act uh, enacted 768.79, and um, inexplicably, a year later in 1987, the legislature actually enacted yet another offer of judgment statute that was then in 45.061, that one called offers of settlement. And it was, it was the same concept, it, it had the same rough mechanism, but there were some inconsistencies between the two. Uh, by the time the, um, uh, the Civil Procedure Rules Committee's petition was filed in 1988, those two statutes were both in effect, and the uh, court decided it in 89. Uh, in the argument, uh, which was uh, supported by the Board of Governors, I think close to unanimously, um, we took the position, and I argued in front of the court, that the uh, two legislative statutes uh, uh, really were unconstitutional, that they impinged on rulemaking power. The court disagreed uh, and, uh, and really ended up as, as everyone in Florida who has contact with this knows, um, ended up doing sort of what uh, the Supreme Court has done with the evidence code, which was really not to draw the lines between uh, substantive and procedural law, but rather simply to say that to the extent that the, um, uh, that the statutes were procedural, the rule governs. Uh, to the extent that they're substantive, the, uh, uh, you, you have this attorney's fee collection right. And that was, that was how, in the end, it all sorted out. Uh, and so we, um, so we started as we went, and well, I should say that, uh, that as I think um, uh, you may all know, uh, the statute 45.061 uh, ended up disappearing uh, with, a, uh, with a legislative enactment that made uh, the statute applicable only to causes of action occurring before October 1 of 1990. So, uh, so at the end, it was 768.79 on the statutory side, and it was Rule 1.442 on the, on the rules side, and both did essentially the same thing. Um, but, and, and they evolved, particularly the court rule, uh, evolved over the years uh, as, as situations were encountered that made this initially, I think, pretty simple idea uh, r very complicated. Because all of a sudden, you know, the question was, you know, what do you do when you've got lots of parties? What do you do when, you know, in, in different types of situations? Some of the issues uh, on availability, for example, of, um, of the procedure. These, uh, the statute was written as claims solely for, um, you know, where uh, there were economic claims and not equitable claims. So these were lawsuits for money only. That certainly would be a lot simpler for a formula that's based on what the ultimate judgment might be. Uh, but, uh, but that, that <laughs> there were pretty much on everything, there have been uh, little, little edges, around the edges where, where things uh, came out a little bit differently. And that's part of the reason why, why the, uh, as I have kept up with this rule and its evolution and the cases under this rule over 
these uh, decades uh, since it was first enacted, the, the uh, treatment of these in the treatise has gotten so long and, and so much overpowered other rules of, of what should be far greater significance to the litigation process. The, um, among these issues uh, were things like, um, you know, it, it, whether this procedure should be available where there are multiple claims that in, include uh, non-monetary claims. Uh, whether uh, it should be applicable to class action practice, um, you know, before or after a class certification. Uh, the issues of good faith, which were written into the, into the rule process, you know, um, if these offers are not made in good faith, it, it, there's, there's a way to get out of the problem. And, and I think my, my impression, and I'd be interested to hear, and everyone's here, is that uh, judges uh, have been, trial judges anyway, um, in my perception, have been very reluctant to uh, grant attorneys' fees, recoveries, and offer of judgment situations, and, and have looked for um, reasons not, not to do it. It's not something that, uh, that the courts enjoy. I don't think the courts enjoy any um, collateral litigation particularly, and Judge Leck probably has uh, quite a lot of views on that. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but there were, there were issues and problems, on, uh, and, uh, but very limited ways in which um, the courts could, uh, could exclude uh, this right to, um, uh, to attorney's fees where the, uh, where the arithmetic worked. Uh, so good faith was one, and, um, and the other was, uh, was the reasonableness uh, of the fees under, uh, given the considerations that are listed in the rule and in the statute. Uh, but, but there were still, those were not the only issues. There were still um, issues of the sufficiency of the offers as to whether they met all of the criteria. Um, there were uh, uh, issues with respect to fees where, um, where prevailing party fees are otherwise available um, under statutes, for example. Um, there were uh, issues where uh, there were contingency fee contracts and how those should be handled, and, uh, conti and contingency risk multipliers also, which I think we're going to he hear some discussion about today, um, and a variety, a long variety of procedural considerations. And, and, and as a result, there have been, I, I've seen anyway, to, to the extent of my experience, a great deal of complaining from a lot of sectors of the legal industry, from the bar, from the judiciary, um, uh, about, about whether this experiment really works. It's created a mass of collateral litigation. It's consumed, um, uh, I, I haven't seen statistics, and I'm not sure that, that there are uh, any, but they are any meaningful ones, uh, but, uh, but there's gotta be an extraordinary expense. It's come just from the collateral litigation of these. It's consumed the time of uh, trial court judges. It's consumed the time of appellate judges. Uh, and, uh, and it just seems to get more complicated uh, uh, every year. So, so the question is, um, uh, has this mission been accomplished? You know, has, uh, has this idea of reducing litigation costs, of conserving judicial resources, of encouraging settlement, has it actually worked? You know, I'd be, and, and for that, I'd be interested to hear how, how everyone feels. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have the pleasure of hearing from two practitioners who uh, dwell in these fields. Uh, first we'll hear from Ms. Klein and then from Mr. Lumpkin. Thank you, Judge. And it's my pleasure to be here today to discuss uh, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart, um, and that is multipliers and uh, why they need to go. <laughs> uh, I'm an insurance defense lawyer, and I literally deal with attorneys' fees issues every single day, whether they be under proposals for settlement, under 627-428, the insurance fee shifting statute, uh, and of course, multipliers. Um, there's no question in my mind that the specter of obtaining a multiplier drives litigation and um, certainly drives up the cost of litigation unnecessarily. Um, all you have to do is to look at what happened in the PIP arena and the, the difference in the practice um, between a, a couple of years ago and now that the legislature has uh, outlawed uh, multipliers in that area. Um, 
you see the same kind of thing in uh, now first party cases in AOBs, uh, assignments of benefits. It's almost like looking, uh, looking at Groundhog Day to see what's going on in the first party arena right now. Um, and I think that uh, multipliers are absolutely an economic club that does nothing to lay, uh, level the playing field, which is what it was intended to do, but instead it really distorts the playing field. Um, now I think one of the reasons I, I was asked to be on the panel today is because I was involved in a recent case before the Florida Supreme Court, uh, the Federated versus Joyce case, or Joyce versus Federated case. And that was a, a, a fairly simple first party insurance case where the issue, um, it was uh, involved a, uh, a homeowner's uh, claim arising from a leak. At issue in the case were whether the homeowners had misrepresented their loss history in their application. It was really a very simple case and as a result federated after the depositions of the insurance agents who in fact had been given uh, uh, the uh, true and accurate record of the homeowner's past claims, uh, Federated immediately uh, agreed to, to pay the claim and agreed uh, to pay the uh, attorney's fees under 627-428. Ultimately, uh, this $15,000 claim um, amounted to a $76,000 attorney's fee. Uh, the DCA on appeal uh, reversed it and said, listen, this was a very simple case from the beginning and really multipliers are only appropriate in those rare and excep exceptional circumstances where they're warranted. Well, the Supreme Court disagreed and found that in using the term rare and exceptional, the uh, Fifth District misapplied the governing law. And basically, the Joyce case out of the Supreme Court breathed new life into uh, multiplier litigation, which, frankly, before that time had been sort of dying a natural death. Um, I found uh, in my practice that 90% of the time, insurance lawyers didn't even bother asking for multipliers anymore. They, they, they realized it was something that was rarely granted by trial judges and even more rarely affirmed by appellate judges and simply ask for, at least from my perspective, uh, an inflated hourly rate. Um, now of course with Joyce case they get both the inflated hourly rate and a multiplier and since the Joyce opinion I, I will tell you that every single case I'm involved in um, in which attorney's fees are at issue, which is pretty much all of them, they have now all asked for multipliers. Um, and I, I think really the answer to the multiplier quagmire is to simply outlaw them. I don't see that there is a need for multipliers. I think they unnecessarily increase the amount of litigation and they certainly increase the attorney's fees uh, generated in litigation and it's entirely unnecessary given the vast amount of attorneys in this state who practiced in the insurance area or the tort area. Um, now for those of you, I, I don't know how many in this audience um, are uh, familiar with the Florida Bar Rule 4-1.5 which governs reasonable attorney's fees, you know that there are numerous factors in that rule um, that the trial judge is uh, required to consider in reaching a reasonable attorney's fee. And w uh, I'll go through them very quickly, and that is uh, the time and labor required, the novelty, complexity, and difficulty of the questions involved, and the skill requisite to perform the legal service pro properly, the likelihood that the acceptance of the particular employment will preclude other employment by the lawyer, the fee or rate of fee customarily charged in the locality for legal services of comparable or similar nature, the significance of or amount involved in the subject matter of the representation and the results obtained, the time limitations imposed by the client or by the circumstances, 
the nature and length of the professional relationship with the client, the experience, reputation, diligence, and ability of the lawyer or lawyers performing the service and skill, expertise, and efficiency of the effort reflected in the actual providing of the services, and of course, whether the fee or is fixed or contingent. Now, in uh, the Quanstrom case, the Supreme Court also um, adopted the uh, multiplier analysis for use in cases in which uh, a fee is contingent. Now, it, it is not required that a court award a multiplier, but where a, fix, uh, where a fee is contingent, uh, the, the court should consider whether to award a multiplier. And the three, uh, three elements that the trial court is bound to consider is one, Re whether the relevant market requires a contingency fee multiplier to obtain competent counsel, whether the attorney was able to mitigate the risk of non-payment in any way, and whether any of the factors set forth in a row, which are the same factors set forth in the <coughs> bar rule, are applicable, especially the amount involved, the results obtained, and the type of fee agreement between the attorney and his or her client. Now, under the established Supreme Court case law, there is a strong presumption that the lodestar represents a reasonable pre a fee. And in fact, in the Joyce case, uh, the court reaffirmed that strong presumption and then uh, basically overlooked it. Um, and as a result, I think that the Joyce case can and has been misrepresented to, as I said, breathe new life into what was uh, a dying multiplier. And um, if one looks at the federal case law, and specifically U.S. Supreme Court case law, uh, in, for example, the city of Burlington versus Day case, the majority opinion was written by Justice Scalia. Um, and uh, Justice Scalia made a very compelling compelling case as to why uh, there shouldn't be a multiplier in fee-shifting statutes. And he argued very, uh, in a very compelling manner that it ultimately resulted in what he called double counting, but what I call double dipping, and incentivizes uh, the taking of non-meritorious claims. Um, he argued, and I agree wholeheartedly, that if you really compare the multiplier analysis to the factors that the court must consider in reaching a reasonable fee under the lodestar analysis, you find that there is a great deal of overlap. And what is not overlapped uh, is the specific issue of whether a relevant market requires a multiplier. And that is the most problematic aspect of the multiplier analysis, and the one that has um, had the most attention in the Joyce case. What is the definition of a relevant market? Um, not only is it imprecise, but the testimony that is often uh, offered in support of the argument that the relevant market requires a multiplier in order to attract competent counsel is a type of testimony which can't be cross-examined. Um, uh, uh, Joyce actually shows you um, really how many of these uh, fee hearings go. Uh, a plaintiff's attorney will often uh, hire an expert to testify that well, the relevant market requires a multiplier because I wouldn't take the case without a multiplier. And I spoke to four or five people who wouldn't take the case without a multiplier. And therefore, there has to be a multiplier or nobody would have taken this case for the mere hourly rate of four or $500. Um, how, do you, how do you counter that testimony? There's no way to counter that testimony from a defense perspective. Um, in the Joyce case, uh, the testimony, the, the expert, the plaintiff's expert, didn't, didn't specify any particular people. He didn't specify why those people said, uh, I wouldn't take the case without a multiplier. Um, and 
all one can do in response to that is, is to present one's own expert to, to, to say, well, there must be a plaintiff's attorney somewhere that would have taken the case without a multiplier, but otherwise there's no way to disprove it. And because of that, the multiplier analysis is heavily weighted in favor of the plaintiff's bar. And um, given the kind of fees that are typically awarded as a lodestar to you know, three to five year lawyers are getting $500 an hour for PIP cases or for basic first party cases, it's entirely unnecessary. And it, it raises all of our, our insurance rates. It really has tipped the balance um, so far against um, the insurers that basically we've all lost sight of the merits of the case and the actual value uh, of an attorney's time and effort. And I don't see any good that has come from the application of a multiplier. And I would advocate, as I did in the Joyce case, that multipliers be abolished just as they have in the Day case. Thank you. For uh, what I suspect will be a contrary view, uh, let's hear from Mr. Lumpkin. That's awfully cynical. Uh, <laughs> my name is Hugh Lumpkin, and I've been practicing uh, law for 37 years, most of that time in a fee-shifting context. And by fee-shifting context, I mean a context where, by departure to the American rule, the other side in litigation, they're not always plaintiffs, by the way, some of Hinda's clients have sued my clients, and I think they're called plaintiffs then, but in a setting where the other side pays if they lose. Why is there fee shifting? Because uh, shortly after this country was formed, there was a sincere aversion to lawyers and lawyer fees, and the thinking was then and remains today that if there is this aversion, why should I be saddled with the cost of paying the fees of a lawyer I didn't select who had and owed a fiduciary duty to a client that's not me. As a result, this country evolved what is called the American rule. There's a lot more history to it, which I read. It's very interesting history. There are exceptions to the American rule, and Professor Fitzpatrick alluded to this, but I don't know that he gave it the full uh, scope at least in 1999, according to the Florida Supreme Court. As between Florida statutes and federal statutes, there are roughly 150 exceptions. I don't want you to think then that these fee-shifting situations are unique. They are becoming more and more commonplace because of three reasons. The first reason has already been alluded to by Mr. Berman. And that is, there is lawyer behavior and party behavior that justifies sanction in the form of the legal fees that the other side has been forced to incur. Second area, which is the subject of a Florida Supreme Court case called Bell, is where there is a contract which allows the shifting of fees as between parties. And the third situation, which I think is pretty common, as I've already mentioned, is where a statute has been enacted which drives that particular bus. And, and by the way, I'm purposely avoiding a point-counterpoint for the moment, although I have some opinions, as one might suspect, about what has been said thus far. Uh, I'm here with my wife, and she would like to leave with me in one piece. <laughs> Um, let me go over the whole <coughs> issue of fee shifting, and I want to approach it from an economic standpoint because people, um, like the people that represent insurance companies who are paid a lesser rate than I am simply because they enjoy a volume of guaranteed business, whether they win or lose, uh, my side of the versus isn't like that at all. I don't have a client that will send me 100 cases. Most of my cases that I've handled over the last 37 years are one-offs. I've represented large corporations, and I've represented people who lost a roof in a hurricane. Either way, they don't generally come back to see me again unless they happen to have a mishap of the same type or nature that caused them to seek me out in the first place. 
So I have a very different perspective on this, as you might suspect, from the other people that are speaking today. And I suspect as well that Judge Luck will have some questions for me later, which I have boned up on, I'll have him know, so that I'll be able to respond in a way that is polite, but well informed. <laughs> um, let's look at the current iteration of the fee shifting rule in Florida that applies to insurance claims. I did not know this, although my partner Bretton Verplu did, and that is fee shifting has been a part of the firmament in Florida, if you will, in the insurance context since 1893. It's been 125 years. And never has there been an effort to remove it of any type or nature. And in fact, certain assertions that were recently made, I think I can recall them, that if we don't do X, Y, or Z, a parade of horribles will ensue in the form of higher insurance rates and the bringing of more non-meritorious cases. And by the way, I dream of bringing a non-meritorious case because I want to lose so I don't get paid. The general principle is if you're going to select cases under Rule 11, under the canons of ethics, and as a person of, I think, abundant self-respect, I'm going to try and bring cases that are meritorious. There's absolutely no statistical evidence supporting the fact that lawyers, at least of a certain stripe, strive to bring non-meritorious cases because of the possibility either of fee shifting or there's going to be a fee multiplier in the form of a rainbow and a pot of gold at the end of the day. This is not true. There are four cases in Florida you need to know in order to understand fee shifting and how it works. Uh, they are in order, I think, Roe, these are all Florida Supreme Court cases, uh, Quanstrom, which is in 1990, Bell in 1999, and most recently Joyce in 2017. If you read those four cases, you will understand why Florida is the way it is and why it has not marched to the federal beat in terms of a multiplier being the exception as opposed to the rule. And I want you to be clear about one thing. I'm not a proponent of fee multipliers in all insurance cases. I think that's silly. In fact, to be candid, I think Joyce is itself, factually, is on the ragged edge of the type of case where a multiplier should be awarded or considered. To me, at least, Joyce is a fairly pedestrian insurance case that involved a single issue, and that is whether or not the agent for the insured had taken an application. And if he or she had, the insurance company under Florida law, and this is black letter law, would have had the imputed knowledge held by that agent, which would have defeated the insurer's defense as a matter of law at the outset. This isn't hard work. So I'm not sure that Joyce bad cases make for bad law. I don't think that Joyce is necessarily the poster child for the type of case in which a multiplier should be considered. And I would tell you that, uh, and I may have a question about this later, there are a lot of lawyers that, especially after a natural disaster, suddenly become insurance experts, and they will advertise seeking to get cases, uh, holding themselves out as knowledgeable in the insurance practice. Um, I'm not sure, and I would agree with my colleagues, that those are not the cases that I would necessarily want to see a multiplier applied for or on. How do you get a multiplier? And as you can tell, as I always do, I'm forgetting my script completely. Um, we're going to talk about something that has very little to do with the rule of law. We're going to talk about something that has a lot to do with policy. And I think everyone who has spoken before me will agree with me that what we're really talking about is the basis for compensation in cases and what is good and what is fair. Some of that has to do with your point of view. Uh, Ms. Klein's firm, for example, robustly represents insurance companies. I, from time to time, do as well, simply to keep myself balanced. But mostly, I represent people who sue insurance companies. So we come at this from very different points of view. She thinks my hourly rate is obscene. I think what she gets paid by insurance companies isn't enough to keep a pet alive. We have very different viewpoints in terms of how to go out about determining what a reasonable hourly rate should be. When you have this type of difference of opinion, you're going to have a difference of political and policy view towards what is the best cure for the outcome. 
When I take a case, I charge a certain hourly rate, and this is the part that isn't considered by the cases or by my esteemed opposing counsels. I will charge a certain hourly rate to clients who will pay me by the hour, and just so you know, about 70% of my practice is an hourly practice. And I'm able to get people, foolish though they may be, to pay the rate that I customarily charge. It's the contingent cases where I can't do this. For reasons that I can explain, I have been involved in hundreds of fee-setting proceedings, and I've acted as an expert witness on attorney's fees as well, both for insurance companies and policyholders. And the process of making sausage, which comes about after you apply Roe and Quanstrom and Bell, and the factors that are, uh, were just read uh, to you, usually yields the following. I routinely get, on average, less than 80% of the amount that I put into a case. Generally, judges find that they are more efficient and will do things better, faster, and get to the end result in a way that reflects hindsight. It's just the nature of the process. The second thing that happens to me is, let's say my hourly rate is $720 now. In the process of determining what the market rate will be, I live in a very populated area called Miami. There are many, many lawyers on the other side of the versus that do what I do for a living. There will be expert testimony that they charge less than I do, and they're right. At the end of the day, a judge will say, I don't get $720 an hour, even though my pay hourly paying clients will pay me that. I'll get substantially less. And then the third thing happens, and this is the part that I don't understand, probably is something that should be asked of people to my right. The court has the ability to either increase or diminish the low star fee, which is the product of this process, by results obtained, exceptional performance, and so forth. Let me repeat that. It has the power to diminish the fee or increase it. So I suspect that the reason we're having this debate at all isn't the fact that a court has the power to award more than what you actually earned as your hourly rate times the number of hours expended. But the way it's done, there seems to be some kind of odd aversion to something called a multiplier, even though you're doing exactly the same thing. And under the range as established by Quanstrom, it can go from 0 to 2.5. I actually, this past summer, before the recent Supreme Court case, got a multiplier of 1.2. The way that worked out, however, is because the court cut my fee by 25 percent, I still had a realization rate of 95 percent. So I don't understand why there's this aversion to multipliers. I agree that they should be applied, not necessarily in exceptional cases. I think that word is overused in this setting, but in cases where they're truly deserved. I had the great pleasure, and I'll finish in a moment. Uh, when I first joined my present firm back in 1999, uh, representing a poor couple who had lost their home. And the funny part about it is it was just rebuilt after a kitchen fire had burned it to the ground, and they lived down in Homestead. After Andrew, they had no home. We were the fifth lawyers they hired, and they found us by going through the phone book. At the end of the day, we were able to get their house rebuilt. Sometimes multipliers lead to results like that where a lawyer, we being the fifth one, decide to take a case because it's the right thing to do and at the end of the day, we might be well compensated for taking that risk. At least that's my view. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions to go in order of the presentations as best as I can. I was trying to take careful notes like I'm sure everyone else here was. Um, and I'd like to start with Professor Fitzpatrick's proposal um, and to have the panel comment on it. Um, as I understood it, Professor Fitzpatrick, one proposal you had um, is at least in the federal system, and I, and I hope that we can talk about it at least with regard to the state system, of shifting fees or having fee shifting provisions on either side um, with regard to uh, summary judgment. And if there's a loss at summary judgment, then there's a cost to doing a certain level of discovery um, so that the, that cost is borne by uh, the losing party there. Um, I'd like for the panel to comment on whether that would work in Florida um, 
and, and your general thoughts, if that's uh, a type of proposal that would do the things that we want to be done, a more efficient system, um, settlement early of certain claims, the bringing of meritorious claims, and keeping litigation costs down. Um, I'll start with Ms. Klein, and then I'll go through Mr. Berman, and then Mr. Lumpkin. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'll, start, I'll tell you what, I'll start at the other end. How about that? Fair enough. Mr. Lumpkin? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, this may be more for me anyway, because... Sorry, the very simple question is, you heard what Professor Fitzpatrick had to say, and specifically regarding his proposal. Um, did you have any thoughts on that at all? And, uh, of course it, I do. I was trying to be coy. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Lumpkin. Look, there's an analog to the proposal, and you may not be aware of this, Professor. In many states in this country, uh, it's, it's a phrase that's uh, shop-worn, bad faith claims. Uh, if you look at Florida statute, there is the words bad faith don't appear. Actually, the word faith does. It's a lack of good faith that actually drives that bus. Uh, but in most states in this country, um, if you lose a case, the coverage case on summary judgment, you automatically, or if you can't, excuse me, if the plaintiff can't win their case on summary judgment, you automatically lose the ability to bring an extra contractual claim. So the process already has baked into it a penalty for plaintiffs who are seeking to go further in their cases and become, as Ms. Klein might say, unjustly enriched. But that is part of the process already. My fear is this. Um, first, in Florida, you can't win a summary judgment motion thanks to Hull versus Talcott. I think <laughs> it's very difficult to do, even in insurance cases. Um, the second thing is, in the federal system, um, even though we are harangued and constantly told that we need to get to trial more often, thanks to summary judgments and mediation, we rarely get to trial anymore. And summary judgments are fairly common. Uh, I would warrant that in the firmament of our laws, some of the best cases, the most interesting cases, the most marvelous outcomes have been as a result of cases that were fairly risky to bring in the first place and could have been lost, and in fact were lost on summary judgment. So I think that needs to be carefully examined and with some skepticism. Mr. Berman? Well, I, because, because I've handled so many uh, large uh, commercial disputes, I, I'm very sensitive to the electronic discovery burden, which is, um, which is, can be so enormous. It, it, it's influenced um, in a very significant way um, the development, recent development of the federal rules of civil procedure because, uh, because everybody is uh, grappling with, with these cases and with these expenses. I, I've seen two, two different types of situations, though. One is the one that um, the F Professor Fitzpatrick described where where the discovery is entirely a one a one way affair. You've got a plaintiff who is looking to find a case, uh, and and uh, with all due respect to the plaintiff's side, th there are some lawyers that I think uh, those of us who have done a lot of defense work have seen, um, who have seen plaintiffs who because they have a tremendous amount of damages even though there may be a significant question of liability, might actually bring those questionable cases because they think if they can get past summary judgment to the jury that it's all going to be worth it in the end. So we, we've, I, I've defended countless cases that I thought had absolutely no merit whatsoever, and um, I would have loved to see some kind of fee shifting a benefit. Uh, but, on the, but specifically going to the um, electronic discovery side, there are those types of cases. I, I think it's, it's hard to have a, a hard and fast rule because in, in commer it, when you've got commercial players on both sides, the, the problem is bilateral. Um, but, uh, but there, so they're both bilateral cases and unilateral cases. In the unilateral cases, the need is the greatest, the frustration is the greatest, and I can understand why in those circumstances that rule would be um, attractive. Ms. Klein? Um, yeah. I, I don't think that that rule would necessarily work in practice. Um, it's not, summary judgment is almost never granted. It should be granted more often than it is. But um, I would be concerned that trial judges might be even less likely to grant a summary judgment against the plaintiff with the knowledge that it would penalize the plaintiff monetarily. Um, we have a hard enough time getting a summary judgment in the first place without that playing into it. Um, and so 
that would be my primary concern about the summary judgment. Also, um, I found that uh, a number of uh, my opposing parties, and I, I won't say plaintiffs, but opposing parties are judgment proof or, or wouldn't be deterred by that because they're non-collectible. So I don't think that in practice um, this would be a feasible solution to, uh, to limiting the amount of litigation. Professor Fitzpatrick, I'll give you the last word on that. Yeah, so I, I think as I, as I suggested, the rule has to be the lawyer is representing the plaintiff is jointly liable for this sanction because the lawyer is making the decisions about what to ask for in discovery. The lawyer has the upside with contingency fees. The lawyer should have some downside if they take advantage of the discovery process to drive up via the case. So I, I agree that judgment-proof plaintiff is a problem, but hopefully we won't have a judgment-proof lawyer. In the rest of the world, the way they deal with loser pays, I mean, this comes up all the time in the rest of the world because we have to shift at least some fees. And they do it with third-party litigation financing. Plaintiffs in a lot of places buy insurance to cover their loser pay obligation. And the same thing could happen in the United States. It's already happening to some extent, as I indicated earlier, but it could happen more. Now, I, I think it's absolutely correct that, you know, Hinda's very good at her law and economics. She's absolutely correct to worry about the judges the effect on the judges, will they be reluctant to grant summary judgment now because they're worried about the catastrophic implications for the plaintiff? This uh, concerns me too. And, 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 and you know, I, I, I worry that the judges will be less inclined to grant summary judgment because of this automatic triggering of, of, of fee shifting. And I'd like to maybe see an experiment uh, to see if the fears actually are are borne out um, in practice. Uh, one last thought. I do find it very interesting that you say it's very hard to get summary judgment in your state courts here. I just had um, dinner last night with a good friend of mine who's on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in Texas, and he told me the exact same thing about Texas state courts. They never grant summary judgment. Now, part of it may be you all have different case law than the United States Supreme Court has with Celotex in those cases. But I'll tell you what my friend, Judge Costa, his theory was, is that um, state court judges don't have law clerks like federal court judges do. And if you grant summary judgment, you have to say some stuff or write an opinion, and it's a lot of work if you don't have any law clerks to help. <laughs> and so that's, that's another you know, incentive-based reason why State judges may not grant summary judgment as often. And so if there's any merit to that, I think you know, tort reform folks ought to set their sights on bigger budgets for the state court system. <laughs> that, that may be a misperception, though. I don't know if you... Professor, if, you, if, you, if you're uh, volunteering to clerk for one of us, uh, <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take you on. Uh, Professor, um, and, and the, the, the discussion of the difference between the federal and state standard on summary judgment is an interesting one, and um, I'm sure afterwards someone will bend your ear about it um, from here. Um, but, but you had mentioned during your presentation about Florida's medical malpractice fee-shifting experiment. Um, I wonder, and a lot of our discussions have been about first-party property insurance, cases that have a little high dollar value. I, I wonder if, if your analysis changes at all if we're discussing uh, what we're calling small dollar cases. And specifically in Florida, um, there's fee shifting provisions regarding personal injury protection claims, which by definition are under $10,000. By definition, they're in our, our county courts and our small claims. Um, does that change the fee shifting analysis in terms of trying to get efficient outcomes and lower costs? You know, I think that small value cases and what some people might even describe as zero value, zero dollar cases, injunctive relief cases. I mean, those are difficult problems. If there's no money at stake, the lawyer can't get a third of an injunction, um, what's going to happen to very important civil rights cases that are all about injunctive relief if we don't have fee shifting or maybe even multipliers on top of fee shifting in those kinds of, 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 of cases. And I think those are difficult, difficult situations, and the injunctive matters may be a special situation. But for the small value cases, I think the better way to go than to 
incentivize a lawyer to bring a case worth $5,000 and charge $50,000 worth of time to it, I think the better way to go in that situation is a class action. Uh, if we have small value situations, the efficient way to litigate those is not one by one with a lawyer on each one of those cases getting an hourly rate, but it's to bundle them together as best we can with a class-wide solution. Um, Mr. Berman, um, you gave a, a very fascinating historical discussion of the offer of judgment statute and the proposal for settlement rule. Um, and you identified in your discussion some of the problem areas that have arisen that may not have been anticipated since the experiment from the, the 1980s. Um, are, are these problems that you see as potentially fixable? Um, should they be fixed? And what solutions, if any, do you have for how we can fix some of these problems? I, I must say I really don't think they're fixable. I think it's going to continue to spin um, out of control uh, because they're, the interests of the parties are so diverse on this. I mean, it, nobody who is facing a fee sanction is not going to fight for their lives. And, um, and, and there's, it, the, there's a great difficulty in, um, in legisl legislating, in effect, through rulemaking. It, 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 as somebody, I spent, I think, 20 years on uh, civil procedure rules and more on the others. The, um, you, you can't, by a rule, <laughs> deal with everything. And, uh, and what's happened is these rules have gotten more and more complicated, and the cases have proliferated. So, so I, am, uh, I must say I'm pessimistic. Uh, Mr. Lumpkin, um, any thoughts on the offer of judgment statute um, and whether it's, it's broken, and if so, if it's fixable? Um, I tend to agree that it's broken, although I will say this. Uh, in insurance cases, it's one means by which Ms. Klein's clients can level the playing field and recover attorney's fees in the event, which has never happened thus far, by the way, that one of my clients loses. Uh, <laughs> but we do, <laughs> but I do agree it's broken. But in the same way as the fee shifting mechanism has broken, every time we get into one of these cases, and I think we've seen the results on appeal, uh, we're involved in second generation litigation with fee experts taking depositions, propounding requests to produce, all to come down to the point of how much to pay. And some of these disputes, uh, my firm can invest millions of dollars in a case, uh, are second generation litigation of the size that most people would take as the initial claim. Uh, so this part of the practice, this part of the problem is a big part of the problem and it's part of the reason that it's broken. Ms. Klein, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I've always referred to the proposal for settlement statute as the appellate attorney's relief act. <laughs> um, there is no question that it is as broken as broken can be. Uh, I, I was just thinking about the, the possibilities. Uh, I think one of the, the primary problems with it is the whole ambiguity aspect of it and comparing the, the release to the, the four corners of it. So I suppose it, it might be possible um, if there was some kind of requirement that if the recipient party received a proposed release that it objected to, that it uh, advised the opposing party that, hey, I have these objections, uh, I'm otherwise willing to accept um, the, uh, the proposal, and can we work it out? I think there was a recent case on that. Yeah. Um, and maybe if that was a requirement, there might be some new life into the proposal statute. What, what about that, Mr. Berman, a, a pre, essentially a preservation requirement for later potential objections to an offer, a judgment, or proposal of set, for settlement? Well, there was actually talk about this, and I think, in, I think in the treatise, in my treatise for years, I've been suggesting to, um, to readers that, that issues that people have with proposals should be raised at the time the proposals are received. It, it, it would really potentially circ, you know, short circuit a lot of that litigation. but. Um, but my perception is that it's rarely used. Judge, I, I just wanted to add something on that. I, I, I've thought a lot about that, and I, I know I've been involved in cases where the trial or appellate judge says, well, why didn't you call up the other side and tell them that, you know, that 
it was you had this problem with this particular language and my response is as as an attorney it's it's my obligation not to tell the other side how to uh, perfect a fee claim uh, against me and that that is the ethical problem that I have yeah, but it, but it, the, the proposal that uh, that I've made is for the party receiving it who perceives themselves to be at risk and wants to um, ameliorate that that risk I mean I, uh, but I can see obviously your situation as well um, Mr. Lumpkin, um, a few years ago in 2009, the Supreme Court heard our oral argument in a case that ended up deciding called Kenny A versus Purdue. And um, the Chief Justice uh, made, uh, uh, during the question and answer period uh, of oral argument, um, had this exchange with the attorney for the plaintiffs, who was Paul Clement. And here's what the Chief Justice said. I don't understand the concept of extraordinary success or results obtained in regards to a multiplier. The results that are obtained are presumably the results that are dictated or command or required under the law. And it's not like, well, you had a really good attorney, so I'm going to say the law means this, which gives you a lot more. But if you had a bad attorney, I would say the law has this, and so he doesn't get a multiplier. The results obtained under our theory should be what the law requires and not different results because you have different lawyers. You think the lawyers are responsible for a good result. I think the lawyers, I think the judges are. And then Paul Clement, who is the only person in the world could probably do this, responds, and maybe, Chief Justice, your perspective's changed. Um, and you recall that <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts was a very successful appellate litigator before he took the bench. Um, and my question to you, and then there was laughter in the transcript, but my question to you is, why is the Chief Justice not right? Why is it not the law dictates, the law and the facts dictate the result? Why, if you have a good lawyer, the result would be one way, and a bad lawyer, the result would be the other way. Why should extraordinary success in that case be rewarded when all we're saying is you have a different lawyer than someone else has? I think it depends on your point of view. In 490 BC, something happened uh, where a fellow named Philippides ran 40 kilometers from the beach at Marathon to the city of Athens to proclaim a great victory. Uh, rinse and repeat ten years later in 480, but, and that, that was Leonides, and we all saw that movie. Uh, the question I think he was asking, the Chief Justice Roberts, is, is the lawyer presenting the case the hoplite on the beach, or is he in fact the runner giving the message? I submit to you that the hoplites, being people like me, are the people that develop the case and provide the mechanism by which judges like Judge Locke can render honest and fair decisions, fully informed about the result and comfortable with the fact that you ruled a particular way. There isn't a person in this courtroom, or in this audience rather, you can see what I do for a living, um, <laughs> that hasn't had the occasion to say, wow, I really influenced that result. And as a consequence of my preparation, my foresight, my strategy, the result in this case turned out in a particular way. In those situations, and I will cede the word rare for once, there should be consideration to an enhancement. Ms. Klein, any thoughts? I, I agree. I've never had a, a problem with, with fee shifting in general, nor have I ever had a problem with a fee enhancement where it's, it's well deserved. Um, I, I think that the, the law in Florida does permit um, the lodestar to be adjusted appropriately in those instances in which the results obtained are extraordinary or, or, or in instances where the attorney has done an extraordinary job in a case. And I think that that should be enough. It's certainly uh, an easier analysis to deal with. It's more objective and more appropriate. Um, and I don't think that a multiplier in that event is, is the appropriate way to reward extraordinary, um, e extraordinary lawyering. Um, so I, I, I would agree that, um, with you that, that that kind of lawyering, and it's, it's unfortunately fairly rare, but when, when I see it, I know it, and it deserves to be rewarded. It just doesn't deserve to be rewarded with a multiplier. 
Um, now, to you, Ms. Klein, you've advocated here that there should never be a multiplier, that we should do away with it, at least in first party property insurance cases. Um, I, I want to read to you a portion of the Kenny A opinion from the 11th Circuit before it got to the Supreme Court. And there, uh, uh, then Judge Carnes, now Chief Judge Carnes wrote, suppose, for example, that an attorney's representation vindicates the federal rights of an unpopular client, and as a result, that attorney suffers a loss of standing in the community, which results in damages, which, re which damages his practice and income. It could happen to an attorney who represents, for example, a pedophile attacking a sexual offender registration law on due process grounds, or perhaps to an attorney in a small Bible Belt town who succeeds in having a popular public uh, religious practice enjoined as contrary to establishment clause. The Supreme Court decisions on fee shifting do not clearly preclude an enhancement of the lodestar amount in those circumstances, and an enhancement under those circumstances is less likely to result in double counting or encourage meritless lawsuits or to go beyond the basic purpose of the fee shifting statutes than the enhancement that the district court uh, awarded in this particular case in which they were um, uh, reviewing. Um, is it a multiplier, do you think, appropriate in some segment of cases he, Judge Carnes gave some examples there, but, but potentially in others, such that we don't want to do away with it completely? Um, no, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, criminal defense lawyers handle these things every day, uh, and they don't get multipliers. But more to the point, 4-1.5 permits the, uh, the um, reduction or addition uh, to a lodestar amount without application of a multiplier. And that's kind of my point here. You can achieve uh, the same result of rewarding attorneys for extraordinary work or, or taking an extraordinarily difficult case by simply applying the lodestar analysis and, and enhancing it in accordance with the lodestar analysis. I think that um, the, the section of the case that was just read kind of confuses the enhancement of a lodestar, which is part of 4-1.5, with the multiplier. They're two different things as I, as I view them. And I think that, again, the multiplier analysis itself is uh, arbitrary, capricious, and difficult to consistently apply, whereas enhancement of a lodestar in those rare instances where uh, very good lawyering should be rewarded can be done without the multiplier at issue. Um, I know at this time we'd welcome any questions. If anyone in the audience has any questions, uh, there's a microphone right up here if you would uh, come on up. Otherwise, um, I'll, you'll have to hear my voice a little bit longer um, while, we, uh, while we do this. Um, while I'm waiting for any questions for anyone to come up here, um, Professor Fitzpatrick, I, I saw you smile a little bit when, uh, when Ms. Klein was quoting from the Daig opinion. Um, I don't know if maybe you were on the court or working at the court at the time it came out or not, um, but I, I did notice a smirk when, when, when she was quoting from it. No, no, I, I, I wasn't up there when that uh, opinion was, or, or that, that case was before the court, but uh, um, I, I did want to say something about the multiplier question if you don't mind, Please. Judge. Um, and about the Kenny A case in particular, which lays out this standard of multipliers are only allowed when it's a rare and exceptional circumstance. Um, there's been some confusion that I've noticed in lower courts since Kenny A. And in fact, there was a Ninth Circuit opinion just a few days ago that repeated this confusion. Kenny A is a case about statutory fee shifting. It is trying to divine the intent of the legislature that enacted the statutory fee shift. And the case says, we think the legislature intended to, to apply a multiplier only in rare circumstances. What I've seen courts doing now, though, is they're applying Kenny A to a very different context, the common law of unjust enrichment that is how we pay lawyers in class action cases. Um, you know, the way we pay lawyers in class action cases, we ask all the class members to contribute to the fee. And the class members have benefited from the class action lawyers' efforts, and so the class members should have to pay something towards the fee. The policies behind that common law doctrine are entirely different from the 
um, policies that motivate the legislature to force a defendant who's not benefiting from being sued and losing to pay the plaintiff's fees. And so I, I don't think we should import Kenny A into the class action context without at least giving it a lot of thought. But that's not what the Ninth Circuit did in a recent case, and I've seen other courts do it as well. And so I would just urge us to think about Kenny A in its proper context and not try to export it to all kinds of other places where it may not be applicable. If you can tell us your name, please. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Morgan Streetman. I'm the president of the Tampa Lawyers Chapter. And um, I just asked the panel to talk about the idea that the proposal for settlement rule and statute actually favors typically the defense because, and I guess I'm the, one of the only ones that's ever seen any of these actually accepted. I've had both one that I've made been accepted and I've had a client accept one. Just one of each, but, that, but I've seen it. But um, it occurs to me, I get from, when, when I'm on the plaintiff's side, I get a proposal from every defendant in a nominal amount. I've never seen a court, if that defendant is ultimately successful, find that that nominal amount was not made in good faith. It seems to me that it generally favors the defense who can always make that nominal, without risk, make that proposal at no financial risk to themselves at that time, create a fee-shifting situation. It's much harder when you're on the plaintiff's side to come up with a calculation that's appropriate at the time to try to work it out. So I'd ask you to speak to that. Thank you. I'll, we'll start with Mr. Berman. Now, um, it's interesting on the nominal offer side because clearly uh, you're right on that side. And, and, um, and in nominal offer situations, probably those are the best situations uh, to go to the court right away and challenge them. Uh, because, uh, because if those are unjustified in the circumstances, you'd remove that risk, you know, as a cloud in the case. Um, and nominal offers have been the subject of, of a fair amount of case law, obviously. Um, but, you know, but having d defended cases which I've thought were frivolous, you know, um, th there, is, there is some basis to do relatively nominal offers anyway. Um, so, so it's hard to, it, it would be hard to legislate, I think, on that subject as well. Uh, but, uh, but as far as whether they tend to favor one side or the other, you may be right about that. I haven't seen the statistics, but, but clearly on the defense side, um, I've, I've done them myself um, a number of times. Actually, I just did one in Georgia. Georgia has a similar statute with the 25% um, uh, calculation, and it'd be interesting to see actually how it's gone in that state as well. But, uh, but I, think, I think you're right. If everyone can thank the panel, thank you all so much. During his naval service, he deployed to Iraq during the 2007 troop surge as an advisor to a U.S. Navy SEAL commander in support of the SEAL mission in Iraq, and he also served as a terrorist detention center at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. His military decorations include the Bronze Star Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal, and the Iraq Campaign Medal. He is currently a lieutenant commander in the reserve component of the United States Navy. He has also served as both a federal and military prosecutor. Since joining Congress in 2013, he has been a leader on issues ranging from government accountability, fiscal responsibility, national security, and the Constitution. Please join me in giving Congressman Ron DeSantis a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be here. I'm glad to be out of the swamp and, and be down in Florida. I did not go on the trip to the Greenbrier, so I managed to uh, miss out on a, on a kind of a nasty accident. Um, but I'm glad I got to be here with you guys. You know, in the House, uh, we have a uh, voting card for our uh, recorded votes. It's not oral. You do that. So you get issued a card where it has your name on it, it has your face, your mugshot. It's got kind of the seal of the house. You put it in the machine, yes, no. We have a scoreboard that lights up. Well, uh, my wife and I were out to dinner one night, and I was getting ready to pay the bill, thinking I was grabbing my visa. I actually grabbed my House of Representatives voting card, put it in the thing, server takes it, comes back, uh, opens up the thing, kind of looks at the, um, at the ID, sees my mug shot, looks at me, sees House of Representatives, and says, sir, we cannot accept this here. You're already $20 trillion in debt. <laughs> what can I say? But you know, I think like some of the problems that we see fiscally and other ways, I think the root, at least part of most of the problems 
uh, lies in uh, the disfigurement of the separation of powers as, as the, I think the founding fathers envisioned. I mean, the founders understood, I mean, the separation of powers was the one thing that they all agreed on. Uh, the need to have checks and balances, I think, was a pretty consensus thing as well. But they were very clear about, while no branch was necessarily subordinate to the other, the branches were not equal in terms of the amount of power they, they, they were supposed to wield. I mean, the Congress had quantitatively and qualitatively more power than the courts. Hamilton said the courts were incontestably the weakest branch. You know, the president had certain powers in foreign policy. There were other policy, you know, perhaps less powers in domestic. Um, and if the president did something domestically that the people didn't like, the Congress could simply take away the funding for it. And, and the president couldn't act at all. And so they really viewed the Congress as the most powerful. Madison said in, in Republican government, the legislative authority predominates necessarily. Um, I think the president was kind of somewhere in between, and they thought the courts were the weakest because they had such a limited role. Well, that's not how it's evolved uh, today. And I can tell you, it's just somebody who serves in the Congress and is always agitating to get us to flex more of our constitutional muscles. I mean, we are the weakest of the three branches in practice. Um, we don't use the power of the purse because we basically use continuing resolutions, which means you have a government on autopilot with very little reforms or accountability. Um, we don't use a lot of our oversight capability, although, you know, with this memo, we're finally digging in on, on some of the stuff that needs to be dealt with. I'll talk, say a minute about that. But by and large, I mean, you know, someone like a Lois Lerner at the IRS, she's retiring with her full pension. Nothing's happening. Um, and so I think Congress has just let oversight really go downhill up until probably about six months ago uh, with us. And we've been in the majority for a long time. Um, you know, the courts, I mean, they are more significant than we are in terms of making policy because they usurp legislative functions. Um, they legislate from the bench consistently. With the advent of, of President Trump, you have a strand of never Trump jurisprudence. Just stop what he's doing, regardless of law or precedent, that I think is very damaging. Um, and then you have the executive, which is by far the most powerful. Part of that is natural because we're in a more interconnected world. We're a military superpower. We're engaged in more, uh, with more countries militarily. But part of it is you have a massive administrative state and bureaucracy, uh, which does a lot of policy making as well. And they, they do way more policy making uh, than the Congress does. And so it's a different pecking order the way it's, it works out. I think that that's part of the reason you have more frustration with a lot of the stuff that goes on there, because the people are supposed to be, you know, the representatives are supposed to be the immediate guardian of the people. You know, they're not wielding the power uh, that they're supposed to be under the Constitution, and so much of this um, is, has gone into other branches. Uh, so if you want to deal with some of the problems in Washington, you know, you need the Congress to step up and start taking advantage of its powers, regaining control of the budget process, um, and actually holding agencies accountable when they don't behave well. And until you do that, as long as you're going to do continuing resolutions, as long as you're not going to be serious about oversight, um, then I think the results are going to be very much similar. And part of the biggest problem when you don't have Congress asserting itself is you really do have a, a, a permanent uh, bureaucratic state that exists um, almost wholly apart from elections now. I mean, I think what we've seen with some of the FBI and DOJ stuff, you also see it in other agencies. I mean, when Trump came in, he was um, revoking some of the pending Obamacare rules that had been formulated. And, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, they'll quote the bureaucrats from the, oh my gosh, this is not democracy. We work so hard on this. I'm thinking to myself, excuse me, this guy just won 306 electoral votes. He's coming in and he's exercising his authority consistent with the Constitution. You're just a bureaucrat who legislating with no accountability at all. But that's the mindset that you see uh, right now in Washington. And I think you do see it with the whole FISA, DOJ collusion stuff, because the people who don't want any of this stuff released are saying, look, we can't mess with the independence of the Justice Department or the FBI. They're independent. And if you think what that means, that means they're unaccountable. And that's unacceptable in a constitutional system. So everyone needs to be accountable. <laughs> And the exec we have a unitary executive. That's what it is. Florida government is not unitary because you have independent elections for different cabinet. In, in, in the federal government, that's the way it is. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the president picking up the phone, telling the AG, stop that investigation. Now, that may have political consequences, 
may have bad political consequences depending on the rationale for it, um, but you cannot tell me that it would have been improper for Jack Kennedy to call J. Edgar Hoover and say, stop surveilling Martin Luther King, you're violating his rights. If you believe, if you believe in an independent law enforcement, then that would be improper, and we're just supposed to let them do, uh, you know, act with impunity. And I'm not suggesting that, that a lot of agents do that, or, or probably 95%, but if there's no accountability, you're almost inviting the power to be abused. So you have to have accountability. I would much rather err on the side of a democratically elected official uh, getting involved in however way you, know, you want. Don't investigate this, investigate that and let the political system take care of the consequences. The founders have ways for that. Then to have a situation where this stuff just goes on autopilot, Congress can't get any documents, the president is not allowed to oversee this in any way, that is just nuts. And so, but what we've had with this whole memo thing is Congress has wanted to do oversight over this. And so this goes back months and months. It goes back to the, the summer of last year when it became clear through actually good congressional oversight that this Steele dossier, which was an important part of the so-called collusion counterintelligence investigation, was actually something that was funded by the Democratic Party, Hillary Clinton. Now they laundered the money through a law firm. The law firm paid Fusion GPS, who then paid Christopher Steele. Uh, but that was something that's, wow, and this stuff is being used to fuel this investigation, which has been the subject of all this media speculation. So the obvious questions had to be asked at that point, and we asked for the information. Um, no, no, no. And so they fought tooth and nail to provide against providing anything for oversight. So I guess the American people, you have a secret court that can wiretap and actually do more than that on American citizens, and your elected representatives have no right to ever do any oversight over how that process works. That's the position that they were taking. Finally, they were going to be held in contempt, and so they had to do something. But now they're saying, well, you don't have all the facts out there. Yes, everything in there is technically true, but it's out of context and you need more facts. Well, who's been, who's been holding up the facts for all this time? I want to release everything. Go ahead and do it. It is so utterly disingenuous with what they're doing. Um, but I think it, 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 it goes to a, a mindset uh, of our elite bureaucratic class that somehow, you know, these elections are just inconveniences for them. And, you know, yeah, the, Trump can't get elected. Oh, he gets elected. They're going to continue to do kind of what they want to do. I think that's bad for accountable government. It's definitely bad for conservatives because, you know, as we see in all this stuff, and I'm, I don't think there was like a grand conspiracy where everyone had a secret meeting saying this, but I think what you have is you have a symbiotic relationship between a lot of elements of the bureaucracy, the news media, and the Democrat Party. I think that's what you're seeing with this. I mean, when you have Fusion GPS getting all this information, they're shoveling it to Bruce Orr, who's a big dr J Justice Department guy. He's actually the head of the Drug and, and Organized Crime Task Force. We have an opioid crisis in this country, and he's getting all the Christopher Steele stuff and then funneling it into FBI and DOJ. Give me a break. Um, but that's kind of what I think we're seeing with this, and, um, and that's just not the way this, th th that this is supposed to be. So bringing accountability to the bureaucracy, you know, this memo thing is one, one instance. There's a whole host of other instances to say that these are statutorily created agencies, they're created by Congress, they're funded by Congress, and they need to be overseen by Congress. That will go, I think, a long way to improving you know, how things um, are, are going. And what's going to happen going forward, uh, I think that there's going to be uh, more information that needs to come out. And, and I'm totally in favor of, of just declassifying all the FISA applications and just putting it out there. I don't buy this sources. I think there are sources and methods sometime, but you know, the FBI on that memo, I don't know if you guys read it, it's three and a half pages. They're like, oh, sources and methods, this is going to be, we have grave concerns. Is there a single source and method in that memo? I mean, give me a break. Maybe Christopher Steele is a source and his method was leaking information to a, a pliant journalist who then puts it, publishes a thing, and then you use that in the FISA application. If that's a source and method, then that, that should change. So that's kind of been their thing, and I think that you, know, you should release everything. I read that Schiff memo. Put it out there. The thing's a joke. I'm fine with doing all that, and then let's see. But, but I think what it, what it goes back to is you had a certain way that Hillary Clinton was treated, 
if you look at how they bent over backwards not to make the case about a variety of things, not just uh, 973 violation or 1024 violation, the obstruction of justice. Congress e uh, subpoenas the emails, and then 20 days later, they're not only deleted, they're bleach bit uh, from Platte River Networks and the server. Um, you know, they're saying that Trump editing a, a, a press release may be obstruction of justice. But that's not, I mean, I don't, I don't get it, but I don't think you can look at how that case was handled and then look at how this case is being handled and say that they're being prosecuted with an equal amount of zealousness, because they're not. Um, and so my problem with, and the reason why I want to get answers in this, um, to me, this whole collusion thing is much more smoke um, than anything. Uh, I think that some of these guys who were starting it, obviously we've seen their text messages. We saw that you know, a guy like Peter Strzok says you need an insurance policy to prevent a Trump presidency and things of that nature. So you get this tip that this, this unpaid advisor who's like 28 saying the Russians have dirt on Hillary they're going to put out in some bar in London. And then you rush to start a counterintelligence investigation. Um, I think that's a big problem, to be honest with you. And then what you've seen, how this goes, doing the surveillance, doing these other things, and then leaking information on almost a weekly basis to the press. I find it hard to believe that the FBI is worried about a lawful process that Congress is following to make information available to the public that's actually in the rules of the House but they don't get that upset when their own people are leaking this stuff all over the place. How did the Michael Flynn FISA stuff get out there? Did that just happen on its own? Or was there somebody in uh, one of the Obama people or holdovers that provided that to the New York Times or the Washington Post? Of course they did. And the media too, I mean, they will, they're mad about this memo. They don't want the memo coming out. They're trying to undercut it. Can you imagine like a journalist not wanting to have more disclosure and actually arguing for less? But that's what they're doing. But they'll, they'll expose government programs all the time involving national security without any compunction whatsoever. But in this case, and I think the reason is, is because this whole narrative um, that, that was being gone, government sources, anonymous, journalists, out, boom, you know, kind of big thing, um, I think they realize that this really shows how thin this whole thing um, has been based off of. And um, I, I don't care if the president's in my party. If I thought there was serious criminal activity, I'd be all about investigating it. I'm just telling you, this, this, this thing is a dud. Um, and I think Rod Rosenstein made a huge mistake by appointing Mueller in the first place because he didn't even identify a crime that you were investigating. That's the whole, the regulations call for that. Links between a campaign and a foreign government is not a crime. You have to say what statute may have been violated. He did not do that. Um, and I think it's basically created a situation where there's not really any guardrails on it, no accountability, and you just, the incentive is, hey man, let's find something. We gotta find something. But if there was a criminal collusion conspiracy, um, you wouldn't have had people like Papadopoulos plead to lying to the FBI because then their credibility is shot as a witness. You'd have them plead to the conspiracy and then implicate other people. So what I, what I see is that there's nothing with collusion and it's all being faced on, on kind of process crimes. So we're going to continue to get more information on this. I think Rosenstein's going to have to testify since he signed one of the uh, FISA extensions. Um, Peter Strzok or all of them are going to come and they got to come under oath. And my thing is, is why would these, some of these guys even be, like, why was Bruce Ord, why do we need him in the Justice Department anymore? Why do you need Peter Strzok there anymore, given what we already know about things that transpired? Um, we got a lot of talented people in this country. I mean, we can fill those positions uh, very easily. So I think that this thing's going to continue to go uh, for the next several months, and hopefully we're able to get, to get answers on it. Um, then the final thing I'll just say in terms of, you know, where we're looking at uh, fixing the courts, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Justice Kennedy is going to retire, but I mean, I hope he does. And I hope that we have an opportunity, to, the president has an opportunity to nominate somebody uh, along the lines of, of Justice Gorsuch uh, to, to, to fill in for, for Kennedy uh, going forward. I think that that would be a good thing uh, for constitutional conservatism and the rule of law. And if you did that, you'd basically have four jurists who are, who are pretty doggone solid in their outlook and understand the proper role of the court um, is to exercise judgment, not legislative will. And, uh, you know, you have Roberts who is, um, you know, I think more often right than not, but I think he's kind of moving. He, 
Roberts is evolving and growing in office, is what they would say, you know, the Washington Post. So if he keeps going that way, he's definitely going to get better articles in the New York Times and Washington Post. But so that, that's the thing about, I don't know where Roberts is going. I've been concerned about where he's gone in the last couple years. But I mean, if you have four solid constitutionalists, three of them, Lito, Gorsuch, and a new justice that would likely be on the court for at least 20 years, and I think Neil will be on longer than that. And, and, and I, I, I told Jenny Thomas, Clarence can never retire. Like, I don't ever want him to leave the Supreme Court. But I mean, obviously, he's had a good career. You know, that really puts you in a, in a, in a solid position going forward, whereas had, had Secretary Clinton won the election, you know, you're looking at a, a, a liberal jurist replacing Justice Scalia. That would have been five liberal justices. And here's my thing about the, the, the liberal jurist. I don't like liberal jurisprudence. I don't think that's the way judges are supposed to operate. But what really bugs me about them is they're lockstep liberals. They all vote the same way. On it. You can predict how they're going to vote before the case is even decided. And to have five of those like that, man, a lot of people wouldn't even have a chance going up there. So I think it's an exciting time. If Congress is going to reassert itself, which we're showing some flashes of doing, and then if we can get um, another really good justice uh, on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, constitutional government will be much better off in the middle of 2018 than it was at the end of 2016. Thank you guys for having me. God bless.